This is our story. I've been talking about our families and the problems that we may encounter in our families. We're taking the life of Joseph and seeing what he went through. And today, I would like to talk about the blessing of Manasseh. I'm going to introduce you into a, a man, a child that was born, of course, who became a man, and in his name we find a great blessing. Since we're studying the Bible and the, book, the story of Joseph, I will read from Genesis 41, 51. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. We're talking today about problems and offenses in the family. We're talking about clashes with in-laws and disappointments with brothers who stole your house or money or who offended your wife or your children. We're talking about children who have offended their parents with the greatest dishonor and disdain. We're talking about the stuff that happens that is sometimes shoved into the closets, turns into skeletons, and the smell seeps from under the door, and everybody knows something's wrong, but nobody wants to talk about the elephant in the room. I'm talking this morning about when you are hurt by someone, especially when you did not deserve the hurt. Especially when it just happened because somebody had a different perspective or was just downright mean. I'm talking about what you do with the pain that wants to turn into bitterness and hate and revenge. And I want to bring out one word today at the end of the message. Please listen for it. I won't be long. One word that can change that situation from despair and bitterness and hate and tension and polarized relationships into one of forgiveness and love and reconciliation. It's a, it's a very important subject. Remember that no matter what you go through, after every crucifixion, there's a resurrection. After every killed dream, there's a resurrected dream. After every valley, there's a way out of that valley. There's hope in Christ. There's hope. Always there's hope. We need to be a people that lift up hope. We need to be a people that although we ourselves go through our own problems and situations, we declare hope. We say God is with us and we can get through this. You can get through whatever it is you're going through. You can get through it. I prayed for our brother Ray Rojas yesterday in the hospital. I said, you're going to get through this. You're going to get through cancer. You're going to get through that divorce. You're going to get through that bankruptcy. You're going to get through that loss of a child. You're going to get through with Christ. All things are possible. Well... Picking up on the life of Joseph after they, they threw him in the pit, remember last week? They, his brothers sell him to some merchants that were going on their way to Egypt. And now Joseph is just a silhouette in the desert. He has disappeared into a small dot in the sands. When he gets to Egypt, the chief of police of Pharaoh buys him as a slave. And then because of his wife's the chief of police wives lies about Joseph. He puts him in jail. And from there, from jail, God takes him up to be the governor of Egypt. God will resurrect dreams. So he was, he was put in the pit. He was put in the house of Potiphar. He was put in prison. And now he's alive as governor of Egypt. And last Sunday, we left Joseph disappeared into, G into Egypt. But Genesis 45, 26 says, And they told him, Jacob, 
saying, Joseph is yet alive and he is governor all over the land of Egypt. And again, I mentioned, it doesn't matter how dead your dreams are, how dead your aspirations, how dead your hope is, it can come alive again. That's the whole that's the whole message of the gospel, that everything can come alive. I wonder if there's an apostolic Pentecostal this morning that believes that God can resurrect any dream. Yes, he can. Are you going to really make me work for it this morning, this Memorial Day weekend? I wonder if anybody over here can say praise the Lord. How about over here, anybody say praise the Lord? I'm not even going to ask you guys. You guys just better say it. And so there's hope, brothers and sisters. There's hope. There's hope. Any, any time we're in Christ, there is hope. These were the words. Joseph is alive. Expressed by Jacob's brothers to their father. When they explained to him that Joseph was indeed alive. And they are words that encourage us to keep believing. Because God is faithful all the time. So even though your son or daughter may have disappeared from the planet or may have disappeared from your life. Even if he is in Egypt serving the devil and sin, even if, he, if you think an evil beast has devoured him, be encouraged. Joseph can live again. In Christ and in his promises, there is hope that in the middle of pain and loss, even if you have wept and grieved, even if you have buried all hope, remember that after every crucifixion, there is a resurrection. That's the message of the gospel. The one who died and rose again can raise up any dead thing again. Now, we'll find in today's story that Joseph forgave his brothers three times. He forgave them before they arrived to Egypt seeking bread. He forgave them when they arrived to Egypt seeking bread. And he forgave them after their father died and they wondered if now Joseph was going to take revenge. He forgave them three times. Sometimes you have to forgive people a lot and they don't believe. Look at what the Bible says. Because true heartfelt forgiveness produces closeness. Because I'm talking today about you that may have been hurt, thrown in a pit, thrown in a prison, mocked by whomever. Your husband cheated on you, your wife cheated on you, your kids cheated on you, your parents cheated on you. They're just cheating all over the place. Things didn't work out, and now they're talking and mocking. Those things hurt. They hurt. So we, we need to talk about true forgiveness because true heartfelt forgiveness produces a closeness. And Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. There's something about drawing close in this reconciliation. You can't do it with a text message. You can't even do it fully with a phone call, even though sometimes that's necessary because of the distance. But there's something about eye to eye. There's something about tears streaming down faces and, and hugging necks and shoulders and saying, I love you, I forgive you, or please forgive me. I, and they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother. At this time they had come. They were confused. They said, uh, we're hungry. Where do we buy food? Go to the governor's house. He's the one selling. And when the ten brothers come in, um, they, they, they recognized him as Joseph, now the governor, dressed in fine linen. And, and they bowed down, fulfilling the dreams he had told them. They bow down and, and, and Joseph plays some games with them. He puts them in prison. He takes them out. He puts the money back in the sack. He puts his own cup in the sack. He tells them to bring Benjamin. And after a lot of back and forths that you can read in the book of Genesis, finally he discloses, he reveals himself. And he says, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. You sold me, remember? You put me in the pit. Now, therefore, be not grieved. Now, the forgiver, the one who forgives, is concerned about the grief of the offender. 
That's how you get to close. And I think I may be preaching to me today also. Because when you can get to the point where in your closeness of spirit, you can be concerned about the grief of your offender, you're getting someplace in God. I don't know if, does that make any sense? Joseph is concerned about his offender's well-being. Joseph had the power to put him in prison and leave him there a long time, forever. But that's not the way God works. Not, don't be grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years has the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be a, not a, neither a, be earing nor harvest. There's not going to be any food. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. You didn't do it. God used you. God used your evil ploy. God used your wrong attitude. Because God can use your enemies' bad attitudes, persecution of you. God can use that to propel you into his purpose. I'm talking about things that can happen at the office. I'm talking about things that can happen in your family. I'm talking about things when you're in the gospel, when you're in Christ, nothing that happens to you is just because. And yes, God does use your enemies. God used Christ's enemies to have him crucified so that we could have life today. Oh, hallelujah. And so... So really, that's why we need to pray for our enemies. So he's telling them, look, it wasn't you. You sold me. You put me in the pit. You wanted to kill me. You ripped my, my robe off. You ripped my colored robe off. But it wasn't you. But God. But God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house. A father means a counselor. Now I'm the counselor to the ruler of Egypt throughout the land. Haste ye. And go up to my father and say to him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God has made me Lord of Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Oh, the good news. So, before this forgiveness we just read, before the brothers come, Joseph gets married and he has two boys. And these boys are born not in the pit. They are not born in Potiphar's house. They are not born in prison. They're born in the palace. Because see, Joseph's suffering was maybe two to four years. And his reign was over 75 years, if I'm not mistaken. Do the math if I'm wrong, write to me. But it was a long time. And sometimes we... we perceive our affliction as an eternity. When, when, when we're going through the battles within the family and the offenses and the not talking and the room Christmas and Thanksgiving and, and that pit in the stomach because um, I hate my sister-in-law. Why did she do that? Why did he do that? All of that. And, and we, we seem to prolong the affliction when really the afflictions are just a minor um, part of our time. And God, when we accept and process those offenses, God has a time of abundance for us. But it is, it is me that gets stuck. It is I that gets stuck in the offense. How many of you this morning are stuck in an offense? You've been in that offense for years and God meant for you to go through that for six months or a year or two years and you're going on 20 years on the same offense. We need to process through those things and come out stronger. Yes, there will be a pit. Yes, there will be a house of Potiphar. Yes, there will be a, pal a prison. But... God wants the majority of our life in abundance and blessing 
after having learned how to deal with offenses. Praise God. I'd like to purchase an amen even on credit this morning. Even, I really, I've got an American Express and a Chase debit card. I know you're listening to the story, but still I want you to praise God. So by this time in his life, Joseph has worn four robes. The one his father gave him of, of many colors that his brothers yanked off of him. The, 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 the robe that Potiphar gave him, the robe of a servant that Potiphar's wife yanked off of him. And then when he went to prison, he's wearing a prisoner's robe. And that one he took off quickly when the king was calling him. So all the robes are taken off. They're yanked off of him. They're ripped from him. Even the one in prison. Hurry, hurry. The king is waiting for you. And the Bible says he changed quickly. So God will always give you another robe. He'll, he'll rip one off of you only to give you another one. And now, now he's wearing the robe of fine linen. You can look this up in Genesis 37, 23, Genesis 39, 12, Genesis 41, 14, Genesis 41, 42. And in order for us to graduate into the next level, the next season of our life, it is necessary to take one robe off in order to put another one on. Now he is dressed in fine linen. And is a representative of Pharaoh himself. And the verse we read at the beginning, and I won't be long, believe me. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. These boys are born in abundance in the palace. They've got the best schools. They're gonna, they have money. They have everything. And because, he said, he had made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And, and then the second one is Ephraim. God caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So Manasseh means God has made me forget. And Ephraim means fruitful in my affliction. In order for Joseph to name his boys Manasseh, God has made me forget. And fruitful, or Ephraim, fruitful in the land of affliction. It means that he had already forgiven his brothers in his heart. Manasseh and Ephraim are born in chapter 41. And Joseph forgives his brothers twice. Once in Genesis 45 and another time in Genesis 50. In Genesis 50, their, their dad is dead. And the Bible says, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, this is at the end of the story, they said, Joseph will pre-adventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did to him. In other words, it seems that Joseph, the, the offended, had a cleaner heart than the offendors. They're still thinking about it. They're still saying, this can't be true. This is after years of Joseph make, having them live, establishing them in the best parts of Egypt, a land of Goshen. And there he fed them and their little kids. These guys didn't even have to work. He fed them. As a governor, he gave them bread. And after all of these years, Jacob dies in, in Genesis 49. And the brothers still have the problem. Sometimes the person who offends you is sicker than you who were offended. He's, he's sick because he offended you. You forgave him and he's still sick. He's still talking about it. There's people that don't know how to move on. You got to learn how to move on. You know who shows us how to do that? Politicians. Politicians. They clash on the floor of Congress. They hate each other on the papers. They talk and then they're out golfing. Something happened six months ago and now they've moved on. Well, almost everybody. They've moved on. And it seems that the only ones who can't move on are Christians. Still stuck in 1980s offense. Offenses of the 90s. Man, your daughter-in-law was 21 when she offended you. She's a 68-year-old grandma now. You're hitting 100 and you can't forgive. Who wants to live that way? There's freedom in the gospel. There, there's freedom. 
And so they said, they said, he's going to require it. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph. These guys are scared, saying, thy father did command before he died, saying, remember, daddy said, so shall ye say unto Joseph, forgive, I pray thee now. Joseph had already forgiven them by naming his son Manasseh. Forgive now the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto evil unto thee. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Joseph can't believe, they still cannot believe that he has forgiven them. And while they're telling him, Dad died, are you going to do something to us now? Joseph is weeping. He wept. In the 45th chapter when he forgiven, the Bible says that he kicked all the Egyptians out and he fell on their neck and he wept and wept. There's, when you forgive, your, your weeping changes posture. When you are offended, when you are offended, you can't even weep. And if you weep, it's a, it's a weeping of bitterness. It's one of these, oh! you, you can't even, because, because, Blessed are they who, that weep, the Bible says. And when you're offended, you, you just get angry. You get hurt. You get bitter. And people who carry bitterness, you can see it under their eyes. They get old. Not all old people aren't bitter. They're just old. But young people, sometimes you can just see that, hey, hey, good morning. It's so good about it. And you've got that scowl there for 30 years. You get old and bitter. You can't have fun anymore. You can't laugh. You cannot enjoy life. Remember, if I brought here a battery, a car battery, and I took the acid out of that car battery, and I put it in a styrofoam cup, what's going to happen? The acid is going to destroy the cup. It's going to eat into it. And that's what bitterness and hate and unforgiveness does. It eats into you. And you're not free. And God wants you to be free. And these brothers had not been free. Even though they had been eating free. From the hand of Joseph. And Joseph wept. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said, Fear not, for I am. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Now what is that one word that could be the secret to true forgiveness? I'm not talking about, well, you know, they live over there and we live over here. We never see each other, so I guess we're okay. No. What is that one word that will change everything? What is that one word that God uses in his forgiveness? That one word is hidden away in the meaning of the name of Manasseh. God. It doesn't say God has made me forgive. It means God has made me forget. The blessing of Manasseh. In a way Manasseh got cheated. By God himself. Because he was a firstborn son. And when Joseph one day brings him to Jacob. So that Jacob before he died would bless them. The custom of the patriarchs was. That through the right hand. The right hand. Not the left hand. The right hand. The blessings of God would come. The left hand blessee would get certain blessings. Like Jacob stole the birthright from Esau. And, and uh, Esau is rich. Ishmael is rich. You pay them, you paid Ishmael this morning or last night when you drove up to the gas station and you put and you put four dollars and fifty cents a gallon, you're paying Ishmael. You're either dead or you don't know history. 
this morning, you're still paying because God said, I'm going to bless you. And he blessed them with oil. And that's why they're rich over there and we're paying them. So when you go put gas today, say, God bless Ishmael. God bless Ishmael. And California taxes, but that's another thing. And the right hand were not natural blessings. They were not earthly riches. They were spiritual blessings. It was the blessing of Abraham, of Isaac, and now of Jacob. And Jacob is about to die. And in comes Joseph the governor, dressed in his fine linen with his two little boys, dressed from the best Nordstrom tennis shoes. And he says, Daddy, these are my sons. He says, who are these? He couldn't see anymore. And he says, whoa, I didn't think I would see your face, Joseph. And now God has allowed me to see your boy's face. Bring them so I can bless them. So Joseph does something interesting. He puts Manasseh, Manasseh on Jacob's left, on his left, so that he can be on Jacob's right. And he puts Ephraim on this side so that he would get the left hand because Joseph knew that the blessings came from the right hand. And so Jacob says, I'm going to pray now. And Joseph closes his eyes and the little boys are there. They don't know what's happening, but one of them was going to get a blessing. And Jacob begins to pray. And then Joseph does what a lot of you guys do in church. He opened his eyes during the prayer. You got to be careful when you open your eyes and pray. You'd never know what you're going to see. And he sees something terrible. He sees that Jacob has crossed his hands. And his right hand is on Ephraim. And his left hand is on the firstborn Manasseh. And Joseph gets upset. He said, no, father. And he tries to get his arms to put them back where they should be. And, J and Jacob says, no, son, I know, I know what I'm doing. Manasseh will also be blessed. But my right hand blessing is going to go in, over to Ephraim. So Manasseh, the firstborn, doesn't get the full blessing. But Manasseh gives us a blessing in his name. And there are a lot of theological discussions and debate whether if you forgive and you forget um, there's good books written by great pastors who say of course you can't forget if, if somebody hits you in the face cuts you up kills your child uh, oh whatever it is how am I going to forget that and, and really emotionally psychologically of course you, you're not going to forget if somebody kills one of your ch kids I saw a preaching uh, one time and the pastor, during the, in between the preachings, he brings up two men. And he says, this man used to be a minister of our church. But he left the Lord years ago. And he became an, he, he started drinking. And one night, he was driving drunk. And he killed a young man. This man is the father of that dead boy that this man ran over. And it became a scandal in the city that a, min, a drunken minister from that church killed somebody. But years later, the two of them, the, 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 the re restored drunk who had killed a man, a young boy, and the, man's, the young boy's father. And they had for, he had forgiven him. And they hugged and they worked together in a ministry. Of course you're not going to forget your son. Of course you're not going to forget the loss. But you can forget. You can, you can forgive and forget the pain. The bitterness. And, and, and so when Manasseh's being born, Joseph grabs him and he says, Manasseh, God has made me forget my family and what they did to me. God has made me forget. Do you know that's God's blessing? We can forgive but. And you'll always live with a but. You'll always live with that but in your life. Or we can follow Christ and forgive from the heart. You don't, you don't imagine the freedom when you forgive and forget. <laughs> Micah wrote... Who is a God like unto thee? What are the gods? That pardoneth 
iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage, he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. He pardoneth. He forgets the iniquity. I believe it's the book of Hebrews, the 8th chapter. It says, I will treat their, I will treat them with kindness, even though they are wicked. I will forget their sins. God forgets your sin. You were a drunk, an adulterer, a cheater, a liar, uh, whatever you were. Or just, a, just an empty person, a godless person. That's who we were. We were all sinners. And when we came to Christ, He forgave and He forgets our iniquities. He doesn't remember them anymore. God didn't, re God didn't remember your curse words from junior high. He doesn't remember your fornication in the backseat of that car before you were converted. God doesn't remember your adultery. Your God doesn't re When you come to Christ, that's the power of the gospel, that he forgets our iniquities. He forgives and forgets. Now, if you... You have that something in your soul right now. You have that offense. And I'm not even asking you just to forgive. I'm asking you to forget. I'm asking you to be able to sit with that person and have coffee. I'm asking you to go into the dimension, into the blessings of Manasseh. Where you can live a life free. Especially in your family. Especially, oh, that first wife, that first husband, he was, he was cheating on me under my nose with my best friend. That business partner, after all I had saved up and invested everything I had, and that partner stole it from me. That was my money, my kid's money. That was our hours I'll close with this story there's a pastor on the east coast his name is Jose he arrived here in Fontana about 30 years ago he was an alcoholic he had the biggest beer belly that I have ever seen he was thin but his drinking just caused him to have it and, and somebody brought him to church and he, he would drink a lot. And when he, he'd go over to the house for Bible studies and things. And uh, at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, sometimes I would hear honking and then screaming, Pastor Sam! Pastor Sam! So I'd look out the window. I'd run downstairs. And when I'd open the door, Jose was already taking off in his car, weaving down the road. I said, God, help him. Jose became converted. He was baptized in Jesus' name. He stopped drinking. But during that process, he told me, Pastor, do you know why I'm in the United States? I said, no, I don't. Tell me. I started a business in Mexico City. I had trucks. I had semi, 18-wheelers, and just bought trucks. And I was going to do a good living over there. And I went in with a friend of mine. And from one day to the next, my friend took all the money from the bank, sold all the trucks, just, just left me in the street. I looked for him. I, I looked for his family. They disappeared into thin air. I came to the United States to work a little bit, to buy weapons, guns, Big guns. Because my next step was going to go back to Mexico and look for their families a la mafia. I was going to kill their families in front of them. And then I was going to torture them and kill them. And that's why I'm in the United States. But the gospel reached me. 
And now I know that God has forgiven me all of my sins. I went with him back to Mexico a few months after he was baptized to take care of another personal business of his. But during that trip, he was looking for those people not to kill them, but to take them the gospel. He says, I want to look for them. I want, I want to preach to them the word of God so they can. And that's what the gospel is all about. Would you please stand? If you're not free this morning because of whatever I want to close this service by saying a prayer for you in this altar. If you want God to bless your family and manage your future offenses, because they will come. They will come. They will come. When people talk about you. You know why people talk behind your back? It's easy, because they're behind you. That's why they're talking behind your back. If they were in front of you, they wouldn't even notice you. But they have to talk behind you. You're over there. You're over there. So they, it's okay. And if you haven't forgiven your father, who may have molested you, your, your mother, who may have abandoned you, if you haven't forgiven whomever, I want to invite you into the land of freedom, into the land of Manasseh. God has made me forget. And you know what's going to happen when you forgive like that? When you forgive and forget, you know what's going to happen? This is awesome. You're going to have another baby, not just Manasseh. You're going to have an Ephraim. And you know what Ephraim is? Fruitful in the land of my affliction. In the land where I wept and suffered, there God will make me fruitful. You know why you can't win a soul? It's already June. And we said this year every family was going to win one. You know why you can't give birth to Ephraim? Until you give birth to Manasseh. Because you cannot win souls when your soul is sick with unforgiveness and bitterness. So why don't we have some babies today? Why don't we give birth to Manasseh in our life so that then we can be fruitful in the, yeah, I lost the house, but you see how beautifully happy I live in this apartment. Yeah, I lost this, but look what God has given me. Look how good God has been. So I'm going to ask you to come forward, especially if you have something in your heart that needs to go. Would you come and stand here, please? <laughs>